very, very happy to be here today. Um, this is, I think, my fifth time to Ladakh, so a bit of my heart is now uh, very deeply connected, and I'm so happy to see so many young people, young Ladakhis in the audience. Uh, I, you know, whenever I get stage, I feel a little nervous, and uh, so my grandmother always told me, when you feel nervous, play, have some fun, play a game. So I would like, can we play a little game, one minute game? Is that good? Okay, can I invite you to all stand up? Everyone, I noticed a lot of meditators in the morning also. <laughs> so the game is called uh, Dule Namaste. Yeah, everyone knows what that means, I think, yes? So first way is, I think in Ladakhi, in Ladakh you say like this, right? Oh, like this, yeah. So you do Dule Namaste to all of the neighbors around you. Front, back, up, down, left, right. <laughs> Welcome everybody like they're your, you know, old friends. Yes. Sec the second way, Alex, can you come and demonstrate? So the next way we're going to do this. Julie, namaste. And make sure you get everybody, as many people as you can reach. Julie, namaste! <laughs> just tell you, you're allowed to laugh at Economics of Happiness conference. <laughs> next way, next one, okay, like this, elbow to elbow, Dule Namaste! Dule Namaste! Come on guys, you can be sitting also. All right, one more, Alex. Okay, this is a little bit dangerous, okay? Dule namaste, knee to knee. something called uh, Jadu Ki Jappi. Oh. Yeah. Everyone knows that? Jadu Ki Jappi. Who knows? So this is the... Uh, Alex, Alex. Jule Namaste Jadu Ki Jappi. And see, I want to tell you something. We all here, um, I'm Jain, Buddhist, we all believe, Hindu, everyone believes in reincarnation, right? In the, so we are, this is not the first time we're meeting each other, right? So I want to welcome everybody like you're meeting your long lost friends from previous generations, previous lifetimes with the Jadu Ki Jappi. So like this, watch me. Eh? Alex. So just welcome your friends. Manish and I'm from uh, Rajasthan. Um, the theme of this session, Global to Local, I thought that um, the uh, best thing I could do is to share my own journey from global to local and how I, what happened in my life which I became such a strong believer in, in this movement from global to local. Um, so, I was born in Rajasthan, but when I was uh, three years old, I was kidnapped. I was kidnapped by the American dream. So my parents went, took me, 
migrated to the United States, they said, okay, we should all go for the American dream. That is going to bring us a lot of happiness, a lot of security, uh, a lot of money, right? So that's a lot of dollars. So, um, so I grew up in the U United States in Chicago, suburb of Chicago. And um, as I was growing up, uh, I, I went to a government school there. Uh, followed all what all the Americans do. I ate a lot of junk food, drank lots of Coca-Cola, went to McDonald's, played lots of video games, and spent most of my youth in the shopping malls. So this is how I spent my life. And, uh, and I was always being told, you do all of these things, you can be like the Americans. This is development. So uh, when I was also growing up, I faced a lot of um, racism, a lot of bullying, a lot of people who always reminded me, you're not quite uh, American. And so as, as a child, I used to spend a lot of time in, my, uh, in front of the mirror. And I would be looking at my nose and imagining, what if I had an American or European nose Maybe I should get a plastic surgery and try to look more like them. And because of all this bullying, I thought, you know, I should now beat the white man at his own game. I should teach him a lesson that does, the Indians are not anything inferior. So I set out on a journey to beat the ma white man at his game. To show I, we can compete with you. We can do everything like you. So... Um, when I went, uh, I went to the university, and when I graduated, uh, I should tell you that um, my mother is a doctor and my father is an engineer. So they wanted me to be a doctor engineer, but I didn't do that. And so when I graduated, they said, now you have to do some work. So I wanted to really, since I was a child, I wanted to serve humanity. I had a very strong calling inside. Let me serve, serve humanity, serve the planet try to make the world a more uh, uh, better place, a uh, beautiful place. And um, so when I came out, I asked all my friends, what should I do? I really want to serve humanity. So they should said, you should uh, become an investment banker <laughs> on Wall Street. So my first job out of university was as an investment banker. And I was in New York on Wall Street. Oh my, two minutes? I just started. <laughs> the hugging counts. Oh my God, this is worse than capitals of hugging counts now too. Okay, so uh, I, I need like four or five minutes. Huh? It's, 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 it's. So, uh, so I was on Wall Street and I, I started to see how the global financial system really works the inside. And uh, it, it, I realized there that this system it's like a match-fixing system. We think that it's fair that everybody is getting a chance, uh, that everybody can invest in the share market, stock market, and uh, get an equal chance. But I saw that the companies, big corporations, they have huge amounts of benefits. Some of those Anya mentioned, the trade agreements, the, uh, um, they get access to all kinds of different markets, they don't have to pay taxes, so many kinds of things. So, and this is, we were taught, uh, when I was there, they were telling us, you know, there's this trickle-down economics. Do you know trickle-down economics? So this is the basic thing, they, how Wall Street runs. The theory is this, rich people should become more and more rich. That's the whole purpose of the game. It's how can the richest people get, the richest companies get richer? And slowly the benefits will come to the poor. So after I was there, I realized that there's not this trickle down is not happening. All of it is going up, gushing upwards. The wealth. So then today we see that 300 people own 50% of the wealth of the planet. So this is not by accident. This is not by uh, people just being greedy or something. It's that actually a whole system is in place to help the wealth get centralized. And so... Um, I realized then that the purpose of my life was not uh, making rich people richer. So I left Wall Street. Then I talked to my friends, what should I do? And they said, oh, you should become a professor. 
when we to help people, say help the world to become oppressed. So I ended up at Harvard, and then I went there and I saw that, you know, these guys, they're doing all these, writing all these books, but I didn't see many very happy people there. Most of the people were very stressed, very competitive. And I saw all these books are being written, but the world is actually, things are getting worse and worse. And something about this thing that these experts who were there, they were oftentimes disconnected with, with the communities, with the grassroots. So after some time, I decided I didn't want to do a PhD and I left Harvard. Then I asked my friends, what should I do? Then they said, oh, you should be, join the UN. So I worked with UNESCO, UNICEF, World Bank, uh, USAID, and we were told you have to promote development. This was, and then I was promoting development with all these people, and I started saying wherever development is happening, there's several other things also happening. I started to see displacement of people, I started to see um, people going more into debt, taking more loans and going more into debt, I started to see much more extraction, mining, pollution, and I started to see monoculture. People all started looking the same. They started dressing the same. They started wearing all the name brands, Nike, Reebok, whatnot. So this is where development. Then people started, again, two minutes. Okay, thank you so much. So then I saw that people started, you know, uh, talking later on when I was there, they started talking about sustainable development. But, uh, and the, but I thought basically, you, the word sustainable was added, but the same things were happening. Displacement, monoculture, debt, and uh, uh, pollution is still going on. Uh, I don't know if you saw uh, last year, they said 92% of the waste on the planet is not being recycled. Even though they're saying it's sustainable and all of that, it's not happening. So something is fundamentally wrong with this model. So I became very, I, then I, I came across this book, in Faraj, how many of you have heard of it? In Faraj by Gandhiji. And I started seeing that this is not just about individuals, but this is a system in place. And the system, Gandhiji uses this word, uh, uh, shaitani, to describe the system, satanic. So I started, how is this, this satanic? I started thinking, and I started thinking, oh, this is very interesting. It's like, you know, people are doing things, they don't even believe in it. People are doing corporate jobs. Most of the people hate their jobs. People are doing, destroying the environment. They say they love the environment. And this whole Western mind and the Western system is built on war and on consumption. And this is the mindset that gets spread all in the name of development. So I decided, to, I got so, uh, these were the major, you know, power centers of the world. And I thought, oh, these are the places to help people. I became so disturbed and depressed by this, that I said, what should I do, what should I do? So then I decided <clears throat> I should go back to my village in Rajasthan. Because I started to think my village grandmother, who's a whole system called illiterate, uneducated, I started thinking she's more intelligent than my Harvard professors. <laughs> she knows something much more about what is happiness, how to live in community, how to how to be with others, how to care for nature. She had one. She never gave any lectures, she never put any input, but she lived it practically in her life, more than I saw anybody in the world. So I took her as our guru. I called her my grandmother's university, and she started to help me unlearn many of the things, much of the pollution or the poison, the corruption that the Western system had put into me. She started. One of the things she helped me unlearn was Reading time is up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll just finish up in one morning. What she helped me have learned was that uh, something we were taught all the time is that, uh, and I think it was mentioned in the video, that we are very poor people. Right? Because we don't have the money, we don't have the technology. We don't understand our own richness. We have a huge amount of wealth. And what actually this financial game is telling us, oh, you're poor take our money, and they're taking our real wealth. All of our mountains, all of our rivers, all of our minerals, all of our relationships, they're all becoming commodities and being sold. So we're actually getting the paper only, and we're losing our real wealth. 
The other thing we are we have been conditioned to believe is that we are alone. I'm alone. If I if I question the system, if I do, you're alone. You're a crazy person. We have to have development. We have to have progress. We have to have the Western system. There's no other way. This word China. There's no alternative. So I started, but from the Hind Swaraj, I got this this inspiration that we have to imagine. We have the cultural and the wisdom resources to imagine a different system. Ladakh is a great inspiration for the world in that. That there can be a dis different system, not a system just on greed and on manipulation and on domination, but a system that is built on hospitality, care, love, sharing. You know, this is the kind of world that we can create systems based on this. So, and then the um, third thing my grandmother helped me learn is that we are not stupid. Because they tell us, oh, you need Harvard, Oxford, these degrees, then you can become the experts and you can tell the rest of the world what is the development, what is the way. But we don't go and listen to our grandmothers. We don't go to listen to the indigenous communities who have so much knowledge, creativity, wisdom, how to live the life with, in a really happy way, in a really harmonious way. So the last thing I learned from my, my grandmother was that we, have, uh, that we have power, different kind of power. We don't need their armies, we don't need their technologies. Our power comes when we connect to our own spirit, when we connect to our ancestors, when we connect to the wisdom and the intelligence in our bodies, in our hands, when we connect to the trees, when we connect to the mountains, when the rivers, when we, when we connect and we share love. This is where our power comes from. So we shouldn't think that we don't have power. So what we did after I got inspiration from my grandmother, she helped me unlearn many things, we started our, our own movement to reimagine education. Because we thought that the core of the problem is this education system, which is feeding us all kinds of lies about who we are, what is our purpose, how should we uh, relate, what is the money system, all of these kind of things. So we have a movement called the Equal Versity Movement, we started our own university, Swaraj University, and we're trying to say that we need a different kind of knowledge. This Western, rational, linear, reductionist mind is getting us into more and more problems. So we need to create a different kind of knowledge system that comes from the wisdom of our people, that comes from the creativity of our people, that comes from the not understanding that, not, that we're not only human beings on this planet. There are many other uh, non-human uh, beings who have intelligence, who have uh, things to uh, contribute to our understanding. So I invite you, I'll be hosting a session on how you can start your own uh, holistic alternative university this afternoon, and I invite you to join. Thank you so much. <laughs>